When it comes to quality sleep, Ashley has you covered with top mattress brands at winning prices and with special financing options available. You can snooze now and pay later. Plus, your mattress purchase helps give the gift of better sleep to children in need and U.S. Special Operations Forces. Visit your local Ashley store or shop online today and make every snooze count. Financing is subject to credit approval. See store or ashley.com for details. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. With the Internet's best converting checkout, 36% better on average compared to other leading commerce platforms, Shopify helps you turn browsers into buyers. In fact, Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the U.S. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash podcast free. All lowercase, shopify.com slash podcast free, shopify.com slash podcast free. Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man with a warning that you should watch out because first it was Pluto and next it's Uranus. Here is the captain. Yeah, don't make me crawl up there and make you a puppet. It's good to be seen and good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. Today, we are happily sipping on this fine brew from 6th sense brewing co called merc juice merc juice is six cents brewing's flagship beer and one sip will tell you why this is a juicy double ipa with a clean finish four and three quarter bottle caps out of five and here's a shout out to beer fun contributor and super fan christine and way mills maryland big shout out to julie a and parts unknown next we have jeremy in fitchburg massachusetts shout out to the great ricky rackman for an unforgettable fitchburg rant on the old headbangers ball and a big we like your gym to ashley d and parts unknown and here's a big shout out to diana in savannah and cheers to diana's daughter as well they are listening buddies and last but certainly not least we have kelly in orange vale california everyone we just mentioned chipped in on the beer fund this week and we are sending all of you peace and love cheers yeah be patient people because we are behind on the beer shout outs but b e thank you so much for the support thank you so much for the love and thanks for listening to the old episodes we have 560 some episodes that you can listen to for free and that's enough of the business all right everybody gather around grab a chair grab a beer let's talk some true crime It's been 30 years since the murder of Raymond Timbrook, and ironically, Captain, here are the words from a pretty extensive article from the summer of 1992 about Ray's case. And the article starts off, the longer it takes, the colder the trail gets. The colder the trail gets, the harder it becomes to find the killer. Raymond Timbrook has been dead since Friday the 13th of March 1992. Someone pumped two bullets into his head at nearly point-blank range and ended his existence on Earth's physical plane. Raymond Timbrook is now a ghost, a memory. Someone knows why Timbrook is dead. The killer is still at large. He or she knows exactly why they killed him and how they killed him. With all the intrigue that surrounds his death, the killer even knows if Timbrook was killed for someone else. Timbrook doesn't seem like the kind of guy who would be involved in some kind of mystery, but then you never know. Those words 
were true back then in 1992, and they're still true to this day. Where we left off yesterday, Captain, we had discussed this woman who presents herself to the family as Raymond's fiance at his funeral. We learn a little bit about that woman. We learn a little bit about Ray's work. Continuing on our timeline here, though, another very important stop along the timeline is in May of 1992. And this is May 29th, 1992, when the Kirtland Hills Police Department publicly release a composite sketch of a man seen talking to Tim Brooke in the Hunting Hills subdivision. The man remains unidentified, but is described as in his 40s with sandy colored hair. The shame in this case is if you want to go down some rabbit holes as far as the internet's concerned, there's not going to be many that you find. The information just doesn't exist anymore. If it does exist, it seems to leave out certain people's names and some information. Mm -hmm. uh, but we do have a, this sketch that we'll be putting out on social media, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Yeah, this is a case that is difficult to do internet sleuthing on. Now, Web Sleuths is a very good source for the Raymond Timbrook case. And another great source over the years, and especially recently, has been WKYC News. Now, we have a friend over there. His name is Phil Trexler. Our connection is he also works at Porchlight to try to help bring closure to some Ohio cold cases. Now, Phil Trexler is an executive producer for WKYC investigative unit, and he's also spent plenty of time in print news as well. Back in 1992, in fact, he was working for the Lake County News Herald, and he has covered Raymond's case for 30 years now. First off, Phil, thank you for covering Ray's case for 30 years now, and thank you for talking with us and joining us in the garage. I appreciate it, Nick. Uh, glad to be on here. I'm, I'm glad that you're uh, focusing on this this case. Uh, it's one that's stuck with me for, God, 30 years now. Um, it's, it's intriguing. It's uh, heartbreaking. Um, it's uh, worthy of our attention. So what were you up to in 1992? Yeah, I was a, a, a young reporter, um, like uh, two or three years into the business. I was a uh, cops reporter for the uh, Lake County News Herald, which was based in Northeast Ohio in the city of Mentor. Um, I just got there uh, after a one year stint in Mansfield with the News Journal. So uh, the Timber case is like one of the first that landed on my lap uh, the first year that I was there. Phil, you've covered a lot of cases in your career. Not all of them will stick with you. What makes the Raymond Timbrook case stick with you? Well, the, this one was unique. Um, the fact is that, you know, what we had was a prominent, somewhat prominent uh, engineer um, who was found dead in his car uh, in this uh, undeveloped, property, uh, development property that was being planned in little Kirtland Hills, Ohio. Uh, his car was still running. Uh, there were burn marks on his leg, which indicated that the uh, car heater had been on for a long time. Initially, police thought it was a, a suicide. It, it, for some reason, it's not clear now as to why they thought that. There was no gun that was recovered from the scene. But they, it was so unusual, I think, to have a, a homicide in the city of Kirtland Hills that everyone assumed it must be a suicide because nobody gets murdered in Kirtland Hills. Initially, yeah, the cops thought it was a suicide, but it became clear soon that he was, I think, shot twice in the head and that this, in fact, was a, uh, a homicide. And the more that people looked into it, the more it seemed like it was like, a, you know, almost a hit. Uh, there were all kinds of uh, rumors floating around the, the city then um, just because of the fact that here we have this mild mannered, you know, engineer, what, you know, who would want to, who would want to kill him? You know, so all things started to come about. Was it business related? Was it uh, personal related? Uh, there's a love triangle angle. So all sorts of rumors floating around. Um, and it was just very, you know, it was a unique case. 
The name that has always been tied to the Ray Timbrook case is George Smerigen. And this is the individual, his co-worker that he is said to have met with or was planning on meeting at Hunting Hills where he's later found dead in his car. The other angle to the George theory in this case is the love triangle angle. And it's always been said that Ray, who was involved with Lynn Egensperger, that Lynn was at one time involved with George Smerigen as well. In, in fairness to George, he's never been charged with the crime, let alone convicted. Um, he was a person of interest, clearly, um, and I think continues to be. He, instead of cooperating with police, he um, hired an attorney, which is his right. Um, and he did not cooperate with the investigation, nor did the other uh, co-worker, Lynn Egensberger, who um, is an intriguing figure who we can talk about a little later about uh, her appearance at the uh, funeral and how that shocked everybody. Um, but uh, yeah, that, that, was the, that was the alleged love triangle. George Smerigan, Lynn Egensberger, and Ray Timbrook, um, all three EC2 consultant employees. So what is your take on CT consultants? And do you believe that Ray and George were a team when it comes to this new development? Yes, it's it's, perhaps maybe a team, but certainly this was not like their biggest thing. This is a huge national engineering firm. Their their fingerprints are everywhere. Um, And especially in Lake County, they were very uh, prominent, uh, especially on some uh, road construction projects uh, that they engineered. They're just a very influential, powerful um, corporation. And what is your take on this possible murder weapon? Uh, Yeah, I I think they believe it was one gun, a large caliber. They never came out with a specific uh, caliber on it. I believe that my recollection is is that the projectile it was so damaged that they couldn't be positive about you know what it was. It was a three fifty seven or a nine millimeter, um, but yeah, I mean they had very little evidence to go on in, inside that car. You know they had a they had a dead businessman um, and very little to go on with, with no real witnesses to the shooting. Phil, tell us about this now infamous incident at. Ray's funeral. Yeah, that, you know, I, I was at the funeral actually. Um, yeah, uh, and uh, it was God. It was a just a very emotional uh, scene. Very crowded. Lots of people. Um, I remember the uh, the Eric Clapton song um, that he that he wrote for his son. Tears in heaven. Yeah, and uh, gosh, I'm starting to tear up myself right now. Uh, and uh, so that song was playing. I remember that at some point. And uh, I didn't see this take place, but I've talked to uh, Timbrook's family afterward. I missed this part that happened. But a co-worker showed up at the uh, funeral, uh, Lynn Egensberger. And she made, a, she made a grand announcement to the family and introduced herself as, as Ray's fiance. <laughs> and uh, that struck uh, everybody that was just, a shocking revelation to the family. No one knew of her, let alone the fact that uh, they were now engaged to be married. Um, she was acting, you know, uh, as a, you would expect. Uh, she, you know, she's mourning. Yeah, she was clearly in love with Ray, and she was mourning. She was crying, and she was very emotional. Um, they watched as she walked over to the uh, to the casket, and. Um, you know, lovingly gave her a farewell and she quietly dropped a, a letter into the casket and, and walked away. And uh, the family was uncomfortable with her uh, appearance there. Uh, and everybody kind of like wanted her to go except for, uh, except for one, one, his one guy. And that was uh, Tim Brooks' son. Uh, he tells an interesting story about uh how he talked to, to Lynn and was interested in what she had to say and, in fact, invited her to the uh, family's home for the post-funeral uh, meal. Um, and when she arrived there, Brian, the son, was told on no uncertain terms that uh, she needs to leave. She's not welcome here. She needs to go. 
which is not actually an unfortunate event because uh, who knows what she may have said. Well, um, now she becomes an outsider. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And it kind of set, you know, it sets the tone for the whole investigation is she's an outsider now and that, and she's not welcomed by the family. So if she ever had anything of value, uh, she just did not feel comfortable in releasing it. Um, yeah. And, and like George Smerigan, she lawyered up and you know it's her right to do that. Were you ever able to speak with Lynn? Uh, I tried to. Uh, I went to her house. Uh, she lived on Menor Avenue at the time, and yeah, uh, knocked on her door and uh, you know left my card. And yeah, she was she was someone. Even her lawyer wouldn't talk. You know, it was just you know it was it was shut down and shut up time. And uh, she, she has maintained that, but I mean, clearly she was the target uh, of the of the police investigation. Uh, they were really, really hooked on this love triangle aspect. And uh, so much so, in fact, that perhaps um, they didn't uh, see the forest for the trees and that there was, you know, something else there that uh, they were missing. How much was George and Lynn looked into? And I read that they may have loosely involved the FBI in this investigation. Yeah, they, they involved the FBI. I, and I, too, I wanted to talk about some of the, the techniques, I think, that they that they used that were pretty unusual, too. And, and maybe they got these ideas from the FBI. I don't know. Um, but there was word that uh, they had uh, retained the services of a female uh, agent or, or a confidential informant to endear herself to George Smerigan. <laughs> um, yeah, to like, uh, you know, spot him at a bar and go up and talk to him, kind of like uh, you see in the Americans uh, TV show with spies and whatnot. So they tried that. Um, they it went so far as to put a, a tape recorder inside of a fishing tackle box and place it on the gravestone of Mr. Timbrook uh, with, the, with the hope that uh, Lynn would come there emotional and spill her guts. Uh, and they would, could capture that in a recording. So they were trying, I mean, that goes to the extent of the unique uh, tactics that they were trying to, to employ here to get some sort of break. You know, and they held uh, grand jury hearings too, uh, you know, and they brought in Lynn and George and, you know, and they took the fifth and, you know, nothing's ever happened. Phil, you referenced the 1992 and then the 1994 grand jury proceedings where they bring in Lynn, they bring in George and a bunch of other people as well, trying to get them to talk and get clarification as to what happened and what these individuals may know. Now, in the papers, after the 94 proceedings, we have we have Stephen Latorrent, the prosecutor, who is on record stating time and time again that we are one piece of information away from solving this case, that an arrest is within reach. We just need one more piece of the puzzle. Now, he says that we have followed up on leads over the course of two years, and every single time that information is leading them back to a small group of people, which he says, again on the record, is either two or three people, a small group of people that have information in this case that they are keeping to themselves information that could break this case wide open. And when we have the prosecutor saying that we have two or three people, a small group of people, you have to wonder inside of that two or three people, does that include Lynn? Does it include George? It doesn't have to, but if it does, then who is the third person? Did they look into the developers, Jerry and Mike Osborne and Jim Brown, who according to the prosecutor, says that CT Consultants had an engineering contract with these developers, specifically with this Hunting Hills area. Yeah, they did look at it. You know, the Osborne, I mean, they're just as well known as CT Consultants out there in Lake County. I mean, they're a large, wealthy family. Um, you know, the third person could also be like a, a higher up who gave the, the okay for, for this to happen. If you believe the theory of, uh, of, you know, political corruption that's going on. Um, I, it, it's hard to say, like, is George, uh, are George and Lynn intimately involved in the, in the shooting or, or do they know perhaps the real reason why this shooting happened? Maybe it wasn't a love triangle. And in fact, maybe it was this, you know, the fact that George or that, uh, Tim Brooke wanted to reveal some sort of, uh, uh, nefarious conduct that's taking place. Um, it, it's hard to say. And it, it but you can't underestimate the, the 
the knowledge that George and Lynn must have now. And, and it's, you know, it's troubling, but they, they are the key witnesses. Um, Where we left off in our timeline, the police had released to the public the composite sketch of the suspect driving away from the scene or a man seen in the area, possibly even speaking with Raymond Tim Brooke. The burning question on everyone's mind here, Phil, is, in your opinion, does this composite sketch look like George Smarajan? No, no, that's what struggled because George didn't really look like the guy. So that led to the hitman theory, you know, that, uh, well, George lured him there, but then instead of George being there, that a hitman was there. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Do you look forward to the holidays? Maybe you struggle with seasonal blues. This time of year can be a lot, and it's natural to feel some sadness or even anxiety about it. But adding something new and positive to your life can counteract some of those feelings. Therapy can be a bright spot, something to look forward to, to make you feel grounded, and to give you the tools to manage everything going on. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash garage today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash garage. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. With the Internet's best converting checkout, 36% better on average compared to other leading commerce platforms, Shopify helps you turn browsers into buyers. In fact, Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the U.S. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash podcast free. All lowercase, shopify.com slash podcast free, shopify.com slash podcast free. Welcome back. Many twists and turns. Cheers, mates. Here I sit, twisting and turning with you, Captain. Mm -hmm. Cheers to everyone out there. Thank you for joining us this week in the garage. In December of 1992, the prosecutor in this case announced that there was a $25,000 reward for information in the case. And the reward money was put up by Tim Brooks' own family as well as the company that he worked for, CT Consultants. Later that same month is when we have the first attempt by Prosecutor Stephen Latorte, who takes this case to the grand jury. You heard Phil talking about that briefly earlier. They're trying to squeeze information out of everyone involved, specifically George and Lynn. Unfortunately, that does not lead to charging a suspect in this case. Then on the 28th of December, 1992, Tim Brooks' fiance, Lynn Egensberger, a former co-worker at CT Consultants, is called to testify before the Lake County Grand Jury. A little more detail into what we are just speaking to. Police and prosecutors refuse to say what, if anything, they gain from her testimony. And we learn then that since then, Egensperger has left the company CT Consultants. That brings us now, Captain, to March 14th, 1993 in our timeline. This is a year after the killing. Police maintain that they are only a few crucial pieces of evidence away from solving the slaying. They set up an office inside of CT Consultants several months ago to try to glean information about Tim Brooks' business life. Here is where we start to see, in my opinion, Captain, the first portion of the shift from possibly the love triangle angle in this case to possibly his murder is more business related. And that's where the lines get very skewed very quickly. And there's a whole lot of gray area there, right? Because it seems like Kirtland Hills PD thought that this might be easily solved in the early get-go. Right. That there's a love triangle 
situation here and we have a jealous former lover or a current lover that attacks and kills the other man in the picture. The problem here, though, is it's also incredibly very likely that while it's generally considered to be somewhat public knowledge or at least knowledge around the office that George and Lynn did in fact have some type of relationship, it's also entirely possible that that relationship was over with, over, said and done, and there was no ill will, no jealousy involved once that relationship was over. Right. And once we have Ray, who is now removed from his marriage, he is pursuing his relationship with Lynn, taking it to the next level. Maybe George didn't care about that. Maybe this love triangle thing seems a little too obvious. And the reason why that it gets all mixed up and mashed together with everything else, he's co-workers with both of these individuals. So his murder could just as much be about business as it is his personal life. And and given what I've seen about this guy, I actually lean to toward the idea that this is much more business related, much more CT consultants related than it is with his relationship with Lynn and his co-worker, George. We know that Raymond was so supposed to meet George. We're assuming at some point George met Raymond out there. But we have this eyewitness that is basically identifying another individual. And that's where I think it gets pretty cloudy. Well, and, and to take that a little bit further and make it even more cloudy here, Captain, we should not assume that George met with Raymond out there that day. Right. And the the reason being is that we have heard a couple of different versions of that story. One being that, that George says, yes, I was supposed to meet him, but never went. And that he had an alibi or others saying that he never went to that location on that day. Right. There are others that are saying that. But it's also totally possible that people got mixed up on who he was supposed to meet out there or did Raymond did Raymond just happen to use George's name because he didn't want to tell other people who he's meeting out there that brings up yes a whole other long list of questions the thing too that we want to keep in mind as well is that as much as it may appear that George may have asked him had in fact asked him to meet him out there that day, there's also the chance that someone else said, hey, you should go or you need to go meet George at this location at this time. What we don't have, the information that we don't have, is who told him to meet George there that day. Was it George or was it someone else? Right. Because the information we do have is the secretary saying, Raymond Timbrook told me he was meeting George at that location that afternoon yeah very fascinating and then as we said earlier captain this thing went before the grand jury twice and unfortunately again in 1994 when they brought it again for the second time to the grand jury same situation we don't have any information that comes out of that we don't have the prosecutor that tells us anything what did they learn during the second proceedings and was it any different than the first we're not told We're not privy to that information. What we do know that happens is there are still no charges brought against anyone after the 94 grand jury proceedings. Well, and what's scary about this case and, you know, reviewing it compared to other cases, law enforcement is telling the public, hey, we're one piece away. And we've been hearing that for the last five years in the Delphi case. And obviously this Raymond... Timbrook case is 30 years cold. Brian Timbrook was Raymond Timbrook's oldest son, and he was set to graduate the year that his father was killed. Brian, for you, all these years later, what does this case mean to you and the state of the case mean to you? I watched all these Dateline uh, cold case files, stuff like that, and to have cases you know solved after 5 10 15 20 as a matter of fact i just saw one that was solved after 35 years um but to to have 
I guess you could say to have two people that were co-workers of my father, Lynn Egensberger and George Smerigan, to lawyer up right off the rip were the only two and still to this day have not been held accountable um, or been truthful because Lynn was subpoenaed by the grand jury twice and was uh, led to, was untruthful, but there wasn't enough evidence to, to go proceed any farther. What is uh, your recollection of the crime scene or the condition that your your father's car was in at the time? Was it, it was it in pristine ki- condition or was uh, there broken glass? There was no broken glass, no windows down. Car was running. Um, obviously, the w- all the windows had to be in there if he got burns on his legs because um, they couldn't do any fingerprinting on the hood because obviously they were in the hood or not the hood the trunk they couldn't do it they had smeared prints but because of the salt and the the it was march 13th you know how it was snowing so you got the salt dust and all that stuff on there so they could not get and i don't think dna was that big of a a thing i don't think chief smith was that good of a a police chief to, to to handle this because you watch some of these files. I mean, they go tooth, they go to like a needle in a haystack. I mean, they'll they'll get down on hands and knees and microscopes and, and, and magnifying glasses and pull hairs, and and you know, so it's it's just bad. It, it it just really baffling. It, it it's because. You know, they had they had the vehicle there. Um, and with the weather being the way it is, I'm sure that that guy was outside his door. My dad was talking. They were talking outside behind did, with something in the trunk, maybe prints or something like that. And then he went to go into his, the car. The guy followed him behind, and that's where, where it happened. And then for... No gun to be found. Um, no shell casing. The answers that you are seeking about your father's murder, do they lie with one person or as the prosecutor was saying back in the early 90s that we believe we have a small group of people? Um, I, I think more. there's more than one. More than one, more than two. I think there's many people that know what truly happened um you know like i said george smerigan was the the co-worker that he was supposedly going to meet at the hunting hill subdivision and he was the one of them that lawyered up and then an odd coincidence lynn egensberger who announced herself as my dad's fiance to the family well basically to the world at the funeral for my father, her and George had a relationship prior. And she lawyered up right off the rip and was found untruthful twice by the grand jury. But with the double jeopardy, you can't, you can't if you don't have enough evidence, you, you're not going to waste your time on it. And, you know, Chief Smith, my my uncle hired private investigators and ex FBI's, and Chief Smith wouldn't have anything to do with that because he wanted to solve the case himself. Shortly after my dad's murder, Kirtland Hills gets an upgrade and an addition on their police department. But Brian, who are people to you that are of interest to you in direct regard to your father's case? Maybe people that haven't been named so much in the papers. There's so many people that could be involved. I mean, my dad was working on Lost Nation Road uh, widening project. You got Osborne, you got CT, you know, uh, they Osborne got in trouble because they were burying the old lines and sewer systems when they needed to come all the way out. There was a uh, the chaplain, uh, Troy Elam, 
uh, I would do my dad's benefit dinners. He would do the invocation um, before we would eat, and he was a Lake County Sheriff. Um, he we had we were members up at the Elks, and he came back here after some cocktails, and we were sitting here talking about my dad's case, and um, you know he had said that I'm not gonna let I'm not gonna give my side what I know unless I'm subpoenaed. But I will tell you this, that Chief Smith, Latourette, and Dan Dunlap will run between the ta- with their tails between their legs. Well, Latourette's no longer with us. Right. We got Charles Colson now. And I have never once from day one have never got a call from them. Never got a call from any of my dad's coworkers that I knew ever to this day. I've reached out because it's a couple people said that, and this uh, Steve Hayes brought up this and said, Osborne's right-hand man knows who did it. So I reached out to the FBI, left a message. Never got a response from them. Another friend said that supposedly I heard that they found the gun in Youngstown that killed your father. I called the FBI. Nobody called me back. I mean, it's just like, hey, we don't want to. We don't want to do anything about this. We just there's no point, and it's it's not right. It's it's not right. How often do you look at the suspect composite sketch? Every year. Every year around this time. Does it look like anybody you know? I, I've i always said, and the other people have said, that it kind of vaguely resembled George. But you know how, you know, back then, it's nothing like it is now with, the, with you know, how our forensics are the science is so many people knew my dad. And if, if that face or you drive, you drove down Mentor Avenue and saw the billboard that said justice for Raymond confess, repent, or just go to hell. It's, it's sad because there's so many people out there that, that could have just a snidbit of something that could, become something and help something help us that's all that are my the rest of what left is left of my family's asking for sometime after ray timbrook's murder his family created the rays of hope foundation and raymond timbrook's memory the foundation has been spearheaded by timbrook's sister susan timbrook freeze it assists the families of violence victims and has helped pay for funeral costs and even bought a canine officer for the Lake County Sheriff's Office. Later, there was a billboard that was put up to remind the community about the murder and remind the murderer about the murder as well, seeking information in the case. And the billboard read, Justice for Raymond, murdered 31392. Raymond Timbrook, son, brother, father, friend. To the murderer. Scripture gives you definite direction and few options. Confess and repent or just go to hell. And while the foundation Rays of Hope offered hope to the victims of other violent crimes, the billboard was unable to lead to the arrest of a suspect in Raymond's case. Sadly, Raymond and Scott's mother, Doreen, passed away before both of them would turn 30 years old. And... Raymond Timbrook's father, Robert, who served this great country in World War II, sadly passed away at the age of 84 in 2001 and never got to see his son's murder case solved. Phil, after covering this case for over three decades and with the anniversary coming up and and you looking back over that work, um, what what conclusion have you come to? I Honestly, I've come around... Um, to the fact that I don't believe that it has anything to do with Lynn or George. 
and the love, the alleged love triangle. I, I, I think that was a diversion um, that costs law enforcement valuable time. Uh, I am of the belief, and so are several people very intimate with the case. Uh, I am of the belief that this was business related, that Ray had come across some information um, about some corruption involving his company and local government, uh, like bribes and work projects that, uh, you know, had to be redone. And I'm talking about the Lost Nation Road project there in, uh, in Willoughby, um, a massive multi-million dollar uh, reconstruction project by the airport there that was done and then redone. And uh, there is, that's the one angle. And in talking to my law enforcement sources who have talked to people uh, in power, they don't believe that they want this case solved. They don't want to open um, that box and because it will hurt a lot of people if the truth was ever told. Um, and these are, you know, these are not conspiracy type <laughs> cops. These are seasoned detectives who worked the case in later years and came away with that conclusion. And um, higher ups just don't want to go down that road. Um, it sounds, you know, uh, like a conspiracy theory, but. You know, I it just it does make more sense, I think, than than some, you know, love triangle among three co-workers who are all single. And, you know, I, I don't see a motive there. Like there's someone's going to kill somebody over, you know, a woman in that kind of fashion. You know, it's, that's more of a calculated type hit, you know, whereas love usually involves like crimes of passion and sudden rages. Um, this was clearly a, 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 a orchestrated, planned hit. And you have to ask yourself, why? And is he getting murdered over Lynn? Mm-hmm. Or is he getting murdered over something that he had promised to go to police about? And some corruption that could uh, put rich, wealthy people or politicians in prison. That, to me, makes more sense. But therein lies the trouble and the problem with this case. It's not so cut and dried now, is it, Phil? It's not a situation where you can just fall on one side of the fence or the other, that it's either directly related to George and Lynn or it's directly related to business. Because George and Lynn are all wrapped up in CT consultants and all wrapped up in Raymond Timbrook's business. And therefore, that makes it quite confusing because it could be one or the other, or it could be both. Now, I agree with you, Phil, in the way that you've kind of molded and adapted your thoughts and theories on the case over the years. And I certainly think that this is much more business-related and that it was a hit, and it had to do with shutting him up. He had information. He was the man that knew too much, and that scared some people and probably could have cost people lots and lots of money, or their jobs, and somebody wanted to shut Raymond Timbrook up, and they did. And unfortunately, we sit here 30 years later still wondering who was the trigger man and who is responsible if, in fact, somebody was hired to kill him. Now, my other problems that I have with this case, my other big problem I have with this case lies with CT consultants and Raymond Timbrook's co-workers people that chose to be quiet, people that probably had information, people that could in some way help the investigation but chose not to. And this includes Frank Frederico and his posturing during the course of the early stages of this investigation. I've reached out to Frank. He doesn't want to reply. He doesn't want to make a statement on this case. The other big problem I have is with Lynn Egensberger. This is a man that was murdered, a man that you claim to have loved, loved enough that you were engaged to be married to him. And when the worst happened to him and his family, his children, you don't step up with answers. You don't, you don't cooperate in the investigation. It's not too late. It's never too late to come forward with information. And the family is the one that's hurting the most. You don't have to talk to law enforcement. You can speak with Raymond's family. 
and offer them answers. Brian, after 30 years of your father's case being unsolved, do you have any hope for this case? I will always have hope. Because if it ain't found, if the person ain't found guilty in the court of law, God's going to have his way. And I slowly every day lose a little bit of hope, but I'll never completely lose it, ever. Tomorrow being the anniversary is just going to be a a real tough day. Brian, what keeps you going? I want answers. My wife, my family, my friends, my work. I've I paid the price in a lot of bad ways for this, but I can't use it as an excuse. It's time for me be, to be able to put this away and put it to rest. Thanks for joining us here every week in the garage. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast. And if you're digging any of the theme music, the theme music is available on Apple Music, Spotify, and also at my website, CaptainFatHands.com. Colonel, do we have any recommended reading? Here's a brand new true crime book titled Bone Deep by New York Times bestselling author Charles Bosworth Jr. and Joel J. Schwartz. The full title is Bone Deep, Untangling the Betsy Faria Murder Case. This is the true crime story, the diabolical story of murderer Pam Hupp. Check out Bone Deep. You can find that great title and many more at truecrimegarage.com. Yeah, join us back here in the garage next week. Until then, be good, be kind, and don't let it. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. With the Internet's best converting checkout, 36% better on average compared to other leading commerce platforms, Shopify helps you turn browsers into buyers. In fact, Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the U.S. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash podcast free. All lowercase, shopify.com slash podcast free, shopify.com slash podcast free. (laughs) 